Cyber and uh, Bubbles Constant. So. Yeah. Hi, so I am from the other distance scale group. Um, there's basically two in the US. There's one news group um, and Adam's group. And a large number of people from Adam's group actually came here from, from Texas and m and they do wonderful work. And so I want to acknowledge that. <laughs> Um, so our group is really, really small. Uh, it's led by uh, Wendy Friedman and Barry McGlure, and then the rest of us are postdocs or students. Um, and I pay particular attention to highlighting the work that the students have done. Their pictures will show up in the corner. Um, but I don't always acknowledge uh, the leadership from, from Wendy and Barry. They're always there. And the byline for this talk and any talk about Hubble's constant um, always needs to be this quote from John Muir, who is a uh, respected conservationist who founded the Sierra Club, the Muir Trail, et cetera, et cetera. He says, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And the connection to make there is when we're trying to measure Hubble, the Hubble constant, which has something to do with cosmology and, and the structure of the universe and the underlying standard model, we actually do that by looking at stars, do photometry and spectroscopy. Those stars are in galaxies, so we have to understand how galaxies work, or how they're structured at least. And we ultimately use supernovae, which are just a huge realm of interesting stuff that we're still exploring. And so all of those things are connected. Um, and so we touch on all of those topics when we think about the Hubble constant. The standard way of measuring the Hubble constant, the traditional way, is called the distance ladder, where we start in the Milky Way, uh, looking at stars in our Milky Way and the large Magellanic Cloud, which are really sort of the same thing. Um, and we see how they behave, we understand their luminosity from other properties, and then we continue to apply that to ever further and further galaxies. And the traditional way that we think about the Hubble, the latter, is starting here and, and reaching out. Um, the way I think about the latter is actually to apply something called backward design, which is used constant, which is used often in engineering concepts used often in education, and I want to start at the back end, at Hubble's constant, what I want to measure, and I'm going to work back to, to where we are here. And it's kind of flipping the story of the Hubble constant, which has always been, we have to measure this thing, and we work hard to get the next technique, the next technique, the next, the next. But let's start, because we want to engineer, we want to measure this like other parameters in cosmology, let's start with H0 and work back. And if you're thinking about H0 and working back, we have to think about some truths when it comes to distance measurement and astronomy. The closest modern supernova type 1a is at 7 megaparsecs. The closest modern supernova type 1a. 7 megaparsecs means if you want to study the stars in this galaxy, individual resolved stars, you have to use either Hubble or 8 meter class telescopes. Okay, and this is the closest one. The rest of them are much further away. Hard measurements, complicated measurements, resource intensive measurements are very rarely done twice or three times. So the truth of the distance scale is that when I talk about, when we talk about measuring distances to the supernova host galaxies, there's usually one data set and one technique that's been applied to measure those distances. Occasionally there's independent reduction. Yeah. Isn't a supernova 2014J and M82 half that distance? But that one's not used as a calibrator, so is it some yeah, sort of... Yeah, it's a highly red so Right, so, so we don't use that... Okay, yeah, no, I get your point. It's the, it's the closest supernova 1A calibrator that we use. Okay. Sorry, sorry. But right, right, there are closer supernovae, but they have irregularities. <laughs> so for the supernova calibration, we use the cleanest, most vanilla, well-observed supernovae possible. And we'll talk about that being a limitation of, of what we're actually able to However, the local galaxies, which is actually where we test these techniques, give us the ability to use lots of different data sets, uh, different wavelengths, different sciences groups, and different technologies. And I think that's important to keep in mind when we talk about the distance ladder. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that this framework is really going to change in the next uh, decade. Um, we're sitting here on the eve of the decadal, um, and only a week after the decadal papers were due. Um, and if you actually run the numbers, on what the TMT, sorry, TMT and GMT would be able to do for resolved stellar populations, you could actually measure distances at, say, 100 megaparsecs using moderate 
uh, amounts of time on these massive telescopes, which is very different from where we are today. Um, and so we wrote a white paper uh, about what can be done, done with that. So the landscape of measuring distances to galaxies is going to change fundamentally with things like W first, J first, but mostly with these extremely large telescopes. So in one hour, I could give you a distance at 100 megaparsecs, which is incredible. So let's go to the original Hubble diagram. This was published by Hubble in 1929. Um, it's always important, you know, Hubble has you know, like some huge fraction of everything in astronomy is named after Edward Hubble. So I like to point out that there's actually a major typographical error on his plot. He actually is plotting, this is supposed to be velocity, and it's actually plotted in kilometers. <laughs> um, so one of the most famous plots in astronomy has a huge typo. Um, and what he's plotted here is actually the distance that he measures to galaxies using Cepheids or things that he thought were Cepheids against the velocity that was measured from um, actually big, sorry, Slifer's work at Lowell. Uh, Hubble did not actually take these measurements. And when he plotted them up, he actually saw that there was some constant of proportionality between the distance and the recessional velocity. Of course, at the time, these were all very um, interpretive things to call it a Hubble's constant and all that. He did not like interpretive statements, so he just plotted it this way. It's the velocity redshift relation. Um, and what he plotted here was this correlation that we now call the Hubble constant. The IAU decided that we should, instead of calling it Hubble's law, we should call it the Hubble, or no, the Lamatra Hubble law. I'm not sure if we should be calling the constant something different now, but I'm going to call it the Hubble constant because that's what I do. Well, Lamatra did Lamatra. the Hubble constant by 1927. Yes. So 625 kilometers per second per second. Which Two is years before public. Not, yeah, not all that different from what you got. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I now when I write, I cite both of them, but um, there was no advice on what to call the constant. It was only about the law. That's okay. <laughs> and so I'm not sure if I'm doing a book law when I say Hubble's constant. Um, the history of the Hubble constant, however, uh, is quite an interesting piece of astronomical lore. Uh, here's Hubble's original, or sorry, this must be the last year's original measurement there, and this must be, these are Hubble's, I think, if, you're, if it's 625 which answers that question. A lot of people ask me whose measurement that was. Um, these were their original measurements. And then over time, we see how it evolves. So this is the year of publication. This is actually from um, a compilation that John Kubra kept. Um, so it kind of cuts off at around 2000, 2008 when he passed away. But the history of the Hubble constant is a story of not knowing what it is that we don't know. So Hubble was pretty confident that he knew what he was doing uh, with his Cepheids. And then in 1952, Walter Botta, who followed in uh, Hubble's footsteps and, and did everything very, very carefully, very careful person, actually discovered that there are two types of Cepheids. There are Cepheids that come from intermediate age populations and Cepheids that come from young populations. And Hubble had conflated the two in his distances. And if you actually properly separate them, you actually uh, get a very different size and scale of the universe. Uh, we didn't know that we didn't know that. Uh, you can see things get better and better as larger telescopes, so the Palmar telescope in here gets better. Uh, measurements are more and more careful uh, going along. And we get into the perennial debate between 150 that bounced back and forth uh, for much of the latter half of the 20th century. Uh, I highlight this particularly interesting point. Uh, this is in 1986 where uh, Kem Cook um, Mark Aronson and Garth Illingworth actually measured seconds in M101 for the first time using charge-coupled devices. So everything prior to this was using photographic plates. And remember, M101 is the closest calibrator. Um, that supernova was in 2011, so there wasn't even a supernova in that galaxy, which means we're not using supernova for our cosmology, and we're not using Cepheids beyond a few megaparsecs. So all of these measurements here are these this truly distance ladder where we're piling other techniques onto each other and tying them together to ultimately measure the Hubble constant. Um, and if, you, if you're ever down and have to write a null result paper, there is a paper in 1983 by Alan Sandage about not finding Cepheids in M101 using photographic plates from Palomar. And it is a very long paper. But it's an excellent way of trying to understand what it means to not detect something that you thought should be there and get the distance. His distance is a little wrong, but still, it's 
to null the little paper that was ultimately. And this, to me, marks when charged couple devices started being the way forward in astronomy. We all use that and take it for granted today. But uh, plates continued you know, into the mid, mid 1990s. And then, of course, in the middle of this 50 and 100 debate over and over, we had uh, the entire community uh, came together and decided that the Hubble Space Telescope would be a failure uh, of the community if it didn't resolve the controversy with the Hubble constant. Um, and the Hubble key project was published, uh, the final results were published in 2001. Mm -hmm. There's something like, I mean, dozens upon dozens of papers that came from that project, which I think is really important uh, to recognize not just Wendy's seminal paper, but the dozens upon dozens of papers that were published to support all of this work. And it resolved the controversy, uh, so the Hubble constant was thought is at 72, plus or minus 10%. Uh, what's important to keep in mind in terms of this we don't know what we don't know concept is that one of the reasons why Alan Sandage was so confident that the Hubble constant had to be 50 was because he put a prior on the knowledge of the age of the universe, which was the age of the oldest star clusters, which is an, an ultimately a reasonable thing to do, right? The universe has to be older than the, youngest, than the oldest things in it. Um, and so he was steadfast that it had to be around 50 so that you could be, I, I believe the ages were more like 15 billion years at that time. Of course, it turns out we don't do great at estimating stellar ages. It's probably not the thing that we should be using uh, as the strongest prior. But the discovery in the, 19, in the late 1990s of dark energy actually let you have an older universe um, to have older star clusters and have a higher value of the Hubble constant. So it's, oh, sorry. It's an example of not knowing what it was that we didn't know. We were missing something in our cosmology that then made everything sort of come together. And that's why when we find tensions in the Hubble constant, everyone gets really antsy about there being new physics that we might be able to discover. Might. Uh, yeah, so there's the accelerating universe. Okay. So what does a modern Hubble diagram look like? Um, so, this is um, a diagram that uh, Chris Burns of the Carnegie Supernova Project put together for me that I really like. Uh, so I use this one often, but I've sort of labeled it in the way that lots of different ways that we think about distances. So there's distance modulus here, if you're a distance modulus kind of person. There's physical distance here, um, if you're a physical distance kind of person. And then we have redshift. So this is actually the log of the redshift. So it's a log log plot because that makes the Hubble diagram a straight line, it's really not a straight line. And then on the top, I've given you the sort of equivalent linear numbers. And these are all the redshift relative to the uh, CMB. So we actually measure the Hubble constant out in what we call the Hubble flow. And that's where the motion, the peculiar motion, so to speak, of a galaxy, its motion around its local mass thing, um, is much, much smaller than its cosmological recessional velocity. So our uncertainty in being able to assign what is the peculiar motion and what is the cosmological motion is very small. Uh, and all of that uh, comes to us currently from supernova and type 1a observations. And so in red here are the CSP 1 plus 2. This is an intermediate CSP Carnegie Supernova Project 1 plus 2 measurements. And then in gray are the measurements from CFA 4, which is the Harvard team. The red measurements have a lower dispersion than the gray measurements because the Carnegie Supernova Project uh, makes observations in the infrared as well as the optical. And because they use the infrared and the optical, they actually get a much stronger handle on the uh, extinction to the supernovae. Whether that is extinction around the supernovae or extinction in the galaxy, they have a better handle on it. And we think that's why they have a tighter relation. And these measurements are done from hundreds of supernovae. And the dispersion here is actually fairly well measured. It's around 0 0.11 magnitudes, um, which is about 5% in, in distance. I'm doing that right, yes. Uh, and that is basically as good as we think we can do with supernova type 1a. And we continue to build numbers here, and by far this is where things are growing. And if you put together these different samples, you figure out that the total uncertainty that's coming on the Hubble constant from the measurement that we do out here from these beautiful data from the supernova community is about half a percent. And getting that smaller and smaller, maybe continuing to use the infrared, 
or it's getting thousands upon thousands of supernova. All of these things are well in the works. Um, and so this will eventually go down, but very slowly. You sort of reach the bottoming out. You need thousands of supernova because of root n uncertainties here. Okay, so that's probably locked in. That's where we are. We anchor this entire thing to the local supernova 1a sample, the calibrator sample. So this plot was made um, in 2016, which was before uh, the shoes uh, publication in 2016, and at that time, there were actually only eight supernova 1a that were independently calibrated uh, and using Cepheids. Um, and that's not very many. And so if you're looking at that, that is M101, and the reason it has this huge error bar is because its actual uh, cosmological velocity is very hard to measure because it's on the edge of a sheet, of, of, and that's what that error bar is representing. Um, and there were only eight. And even now, with the larger sample, um, the local supernova contributes somewhere between 1% to 2% on the error budget uh, of h naught from this calibration. And if our goal is to engineer some sort of measurement of the Hubble constant, we want to get to the highest precision possible, which the number quoted is often 1%. And that's when the CMB, that is when the CMB community says that they will use h naught as a prior on their measurements, is when we get to 1%. Uh, we're well beyond 1% just getting down to where we're calibrating the supernova 1A, and we haven't even talked about uh, the distance measurements, the Cepheids, or whatever technique we want to use. So one of the biggest limitations in this engineering experiment that we run into is the small number of calibrating galaxies. Uh, so it is larger now, it's at 19, and there's an immense amount of data being collected by the Hubble telescope at the moment. But it still comes out somewhere between 1% to 2%. Okay, and then we put it all together, um, and that's what the modern Hubble diagram looks like. Um, and this sort of large uncertainty that was coming from the calibration of the supernova used to be a very small term in the uncertainty budget. So here's the Hubble constant from 2000 uh, to 2016, which is when I cut off a lot of this plot. Um, and here's the key project measurement at 10%. And we see that the distance ladder measurements, which are in blue, which are ultimately local measurements of measurements in the local universe which directly measure the Hubble constant, the local expansion rate, um, are actually incredibly consistent uh, with themselves. So again, two teams here, Friedman team, Chu's team, um, uh, completely optical, uh, optical plus infrared, mid-infrared, optical plus infrared. Well, two different teams, slightly different data sets, different wavelengths, um, all very much agree with each other, which is a hallmark of, of doing these measurements properly. Uh, it's doing them in many different ways. And the other way, the other competing way of getting the Hubble constant is to model the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background, which is fundamentally measuring a parameter in the young universe, and you indirectly measure the Hubble constant. So you measure a set of parameters in the cosmic microwave background, and you have your standard model, and you integrate that back to get the local h naught measurement. So they're very indirect. So they we actually think that the key project probably overestimated their uncertainty. Sure. Um, there's a paper about that. But um, yeah, so it's it's random noise in so it's systematics in the sense that um, it's calibrating the techniques that we use. Right, because it's yeah. random and instead of the airport, you expect so much more scatter. Right. They're all basically consistent, you know. Right. Control That's, for, um, for you often see arguments that, you know, these are yeah. all independent measurements, and then if we put them all together, we should get an answer. Yeah. Um, and I don't actually think that's true because these are actually highly correlated with measurements. Um, and so, one argument that you often see is that this tension, this disagreement between the blue and the red here, um, is just what we expect from random measurement uncertainties. But these are highly correlated measurements. So if there were two independent data sets, would you expect that? Yeah, so you often see that interpretation of what we're seeing. Um, but uh, there are things that tie these data sets together. For instance, in the shoes sample, even the most recent publications, um, a number of those galaxies are Cepheids that were discovered in the key project. And that's that point when I was saying that hard measurements aren't often repeated. If you wanted to go reobserve Cepheids, the Hubble TAC is probably not going to give you 20 orbits to go do that because it's already been done. So they're actually using the same data and the same images and the same Cepheids. So if there was something weird in those Cepheids here, 
it would actually propagate through to here. Now, in the SHOES project, they actually look at the cepheids in the infrared, and the distances actually come from the infrared. So some of that is decoupled. But a lot of the reductions of the SHOES data by, so Brian Schmidt's uh, PhD student, Bonnie Zhang, did a really nice one, um, actually show that this number that comes out is in the data. You can change all the assumptions you make about how you fit the cepheids, about how you fit the supernova. You can throw them into all 20 different supernova fitters and make different assumptions, and you basically come out with the same answer, 70 ish but the error bars actually get bigger or smaller um, so there is something deterministic in, in, in the data which is a, which could be a systematic um, and there is something deterministic about these red points too which are the C and B that is you're, we're basically using the same standard model to do the fitting the data gets better and better different teams different instruments but th there is something that ties all of these together and this tension, and if you go back into these papers, this tension has been here actually for a long time, uh, that they've been disagreeing and starting to diverge in their measurements. But it really wasn't until these error bars got so small that you could claim something like three and a half sigma, or 3.6 sigma, I think, was the original number in this publication, um, that it became interesting. And that was mostly because our error bars on the distance scale side were uh, large. And so currently, um, this has evolved a bit. We're close to five sigma differences between the most recent Planck measurement and the most recent uh, calibration of the cepheids using guy results, et cetera. Um, and so that, in a statistical way, tells you that we're measuring something different at very high confidence. And we are actually measuring something different. Um, so the question, of course, is um, why would we get two different values from these two different techniques? Uh, one is that there are continued to be systematics in either or both sets of measurements that we don't understand or we don't take into account. Uh, in Planck, we believe that they are instrumental systematics, something about how they make the measurements and reduce the data. So that's where we think they come from. They're not astrophysical in nature. In the distance scale, we usually assume that they're astrophysical in nature. We just don't understand stars well enough. We don't understand. So supernova get the, unfortunately, get the highest end of the we don't understand this. Um, stick, uh, which is why I like to show how beautiful the H naught, the Hubble flow data is for supernova, because even not understanding them, they behave with within 5% precision of each other, even if we don't understand them. And I don't think that's fair. Um, the exciting thing for the theorists is that we're missing physics in the standard cosmology. So if we don't put the physics into the, super, into the C and B measurements, we don't get the physics back out, that's why we get a difference. Um, unfortunately, the CMB um, ties together so much physics so tightly that there's not a lot of space for sort of vanilla things to put in very simple things into the cosmology. You have to do things that are very exotic. Um, some theorists get really excited about that. Some theorists say it's blasphemy. So um, I've gotten both. Uh, we can also be missing physics in the stars. Um, there's a lot of terms that go into Cepheid-based distances, and I'll go into them later. If we don't have those exactly right, we might get the wrong answer. Um, or stars are different then and now. All these kinds of things go in there. And then, of course, the fourth thing is that we don't know what we, it is that we don't know, and that there's something that we haven't thought about that will fall out of this analysis or continue to test these measurements. Um, and, and that, I think, would have to be pretty wicked because a lot of really smart people are, are thinking about this right now. Okay. Uh, but when it comes to the precision, that we can measure H naught from the distance ladder, as I pointed out, there's very few independent supernova 1A calibrators, and the question is why are there so few? If we had more calibrators, maybe we'd have a better handle on this measurement. And so, uh, one thing that I often hear is that we just don't have many supernova in the local volume. Uh, and so, here's a plot as of March, so all these things kind of cut off in, in March 2016, I just locked it down. But here's a plot of all of the supernova that were known uh, against their distance out to 80 megaparsecs. This is just a very simple histogram, and these are Poisson uh, error bars, counting error bars. And the current limit to where we do Cepheid distances is somewhere around 40 megaparsecs, and so that's this, this limit here. Um, and so we only have about 20 that are calibrated, so naively you would think there's only 20 down here, um, and that's not there's actually quite a large number. I think there's 95 within 40 megaparsecs, as um, 
right hand read it out. Um, so in theory, there's 95 supernovae that we could use. Um, so maybe they've only been discovered recently. We've had these all-sky supernova surveys turning on. They all just got discovered in the last couple of years. We haven't had time to monitor them for a year to find super, uh, cepheids, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is the same plot, and I cut just to within 40 megaparsecs, so there's 95 supernova 1A, and I plotted them against their discovery year because supernova are really nice and that their discovery year is embedded in their name. Uh, so this was just a string manipulation. And so we can see that, yeah, it was true that, um, in the late 20th uh, century that there were only a handful of supernova discovered each year, but turning on sometime around 2005, which is when I think uh, amateurs realized this would be a lot of fun, uh, everything sort of skyrocketed, and there's actually been a dearth at this time, there was a dearth of supernova actually being discovered sort of within 40 megaparsecs, which is just statistics, it's just fluctuations. Um, for instance, last year I think we had five within uh, 20 megaparsecs, so. Um, it's also possible that some of these are misidentifications or misclassifications. Uh, the follow-up, the really, really good follow-up networks for supernova sort of turned on in here, and, um, and CSP was running, but you only followed up the ones that were going to be the, the most, the gems, right? So there could be some misclassifications in there as well. So there's actually plenty of supernova out there that we could do this calibration at a much higher fidelity. And so this has to do with whether or not the supernova that we discover in Galaxy X is suitable for being a calibrator. And what goes into that? It goes into characterizing the supernova itself and some of its properties. And then can I measure a distance to the galaxy to get the distances? Two components. So when I characterize the supernova, I want to worry about did I find it before peak light so I can actually measure the stretch factor properly? Can I remove the galaxy or nearby bright sources? Do I have multiband light curves? Can I estimate local extinction and other types of issues? Um, and the answer is yes, most of the time you can do all of this. Um, because the supernova transient communities um, are phenomenally well working together to make sure all this data happens for all the supernovas that, supernova that go off in the nearby universe. And so uh, Chris Burns actually went through for me every single supernova within 40 megaparsecs, and 40 of those he thinks he could get a, a distance to using his fitter. So there's 40 available that we could be using, which is twice as many as, as are in the, in the literature now. And so the question then becomes, can I measure its distance? And the only way that we do this currently is with Cepheids. So what do I need to measure a Cepheid distance? So I flipped to this plot, um, which is from uh, Reese et al. and Hoffman et al. Uh, of the 19 calibrators to give a sense for what it means to measure distance with Cepheids. And you may be familiar with this because people in your department do the work, but I like to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so these are the 19 supernova galaxies. Uh, and what you do to get a Cepheid-based distance is you measure the period of the star. So this is log P. And uh, it's apparent magnitude luminosity. And you plot them up. And there's a very nice log-log linear relationship uh, between these two values. And so this is from a paper by Eric Person et al. But this is fundamentally the same type of data that Henrietta uh, Levitt used in uh, 1908 and 1912 to discover this relationship, um, but this is in the infrared. And um, what's nice is that the intrinsic scatter of this relationship for, for log p between 0.5 and 2 is about a tenth of a magnitude, which is 5% in distance, and that's fantastic. It's a wonderful, beautiful tool. Um, it's a lot of work. You have to get the periods, you have to find the, you have to find the stars, get the periods, measure them in the optical and the infrared, you need colors, you have to type them, you have to do a lot of work. It's hard work, um, it's beautiful. Um, and you can see that this has been done for uh, 20 or 19 hosts, and then we have four calibrator systems, the LMC, Milky Way, M31, and NHC 42. Uh, but when you look at these period luminosity diagrams, you're gonna see that they don't all look equally beautiful as what I showed you. So M101 looks pretty nice, lots of supernova, sorry, lots of Cepheids, uh, well populated. But here's uh, NGC 4424 here, which has four sources in it. And this is not for a lack of trying and wonderful work. It's because um, this galaxy, it's this one here, which is probably hard to see, this galaxy just doesn't have Cepheids in it. 
It's not a star-forming galaxy. It's a blob galaxy with a little bit of gas in the middle that happens to have a supernova. Uh, this beautifully well-populated 3370 is a face-on spiral, and you get a beautiful distance to that galaxy. Uh, this galaxy is, is pretty good. It's not as well-populated, and the reason is because it is a heavily barred galaxy, and it only has star-forming in an outer ring. So you get a lower number of Cepheids, and you tend to get um, older ones. So you're biased to one side of the period of Nazi relationship because of the stellar populations in this galaxy. And then 44038 happens to be the Antennae galaxy. A lot of people don't know that the Antennae has one of our calibrators supernova in it. Um, it is a very dusty galaxy, and it's a merging galaxy. And it's very difficult to find the supernova there, uh, sorry, the Cepheids there, because they're self-instinctive. They're heavily self-instinctive. And that's why you, you're biased towards the brighter ones, and there's not terribly many of them. Uh, because this, this star formation is very so one of the reasons why every supernova that we could use to calibrate this isn't being used is because Cepheids can only get us distances to specific galaxies that have Cepheids, which happen to be based on star-forming galaxies. No matter how hard you try, we'll never be able to pull out a good Cepheid sample. Or what you um, so I listed all those things, uh, star-forming, luminous, face on then you have to collect all the data, which again, it's a large commitment of resources, but it's a, it's a beautiful technique and we should absolutely do it. Um, and so this is one of the limitations that we have to this calibrator sample. Cepheids are amazing, brilliant tools. I work with Cepheids all the time. I think they're fantastic. But for this problem, they may not be the tool that we want to get distances to supernova hosts. Okay, so what am I proposing then? And so I like to do this quote, and the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes, looking at the problem differently, engineering the problem. And what we have to work with today that we haven't had in the previous century is Gaia. So Gaia is a satellite, it's uh, at L2, it is scanning the sky, getting proper motions of parallaxes of everything in the sky, with a sort of white light magnitude brighter than 20th magnitude. And to give you a sense for what Gaia has done for us, the sun is here, and this tiny circle here is the 10% parallax precision limit from the Hipparchus satellite, that tiny little dot. Beyond that uh, range, which is about 100 parsecs, the only stars where we have good independent distances would either be in the LMC, where we have a good measurement of the LMC, or uh, by select stars that where you can get parallaxes from HST. Um, so there's several different ways to do that. So there's a handful of stars where we have good parallaxes better than 10%. Otherwise, um, everything else is from a secondary distance indicator, and that's how we do the calibration. Gaia's 10% parallax limit in the nominal five-year mission is at 10 kiloparsecs. So now, instead of just the solar neighborhood, we actually have a representative volume of the disk of our galaxy. Um, Guy has been extended to a seven-year mission, it might get an extension to a ten-year mission, and this, this circle will expand. Um, and then just for reference, the um, proper motion, one kilometer per second proper motion measurement goes out to about 20 kiloparsecs in the nominal five-year mission, which gets you past the center of our galaxy. And what Gaia really gives us is access not just to the brightest and most interesting stars that we need for a problem, but it gives us the entirety of the Hertzberg-Russell diagram. So this is the Hertzberg-Russell diagram, where this is color, this is the uh, Gaia color here, and luminosity on this axis, where bright is at the top, smaller numbers, uh, faint is bigger numbers at the bottom, red is cooler stars, blue is hotter stars, and this is data from TGAS. This isn't even Gaia DR2, this is Gaia DR1. It's just the best diagram that's been published. And you can see all of the things that you learned in Astro 101, the main sequence, the binary sequence, it's red clump, red giant branch. Um, unfortunately, the supernova when I hosts are mostly very far away. So things on the main sequence and even you know, sort of at the horizontal branch and below are just gonna be out of reach, even of um, JWST. They are in reach with the 30 meter class telescopes. There's other complications there. So we're not going to be able to use these kinds of distance indicators here. 
Um, here is our classical, roughly where the classical instability strip will go. Your cepheids live in there, and it goes down and inter interacts there with the delta skew stars. And now we can, lim we can label some of the interesting distance indicator standard candles that we have. So there's the Myras, the Cepheids, and the Aurelyri, which are all variable type stars. Uh, the Aurelyri are ultimately pretty faint. They're tricky to get distances because they need a metallicity component to its very strong metallicity term. So for things that are very far away, that's going to be very hard. So they're not ideal. They're wonderful for within the local group. They are, they are by far the, the way to go about it because you can get 1% distances to individual stars. Here are the Cepheids that we've talked about. They're only in star-forming galaxies. Another option are Myras, and Myras are wicked cool stars. Um, we don't know a lot about them, though. Um, a lot of that research is happening now, and I think that's really exciting. But um, they are dusty AGB stars that are pulsating. They have very long periods. They have dust shells. They make a lot of chemistry. They're wicked, wicked beasts. Um, and so that's really exciting that work's going on there. We have the red clump, which is here. The red clump has very strong population concerns, um, so the color and the magnitude change based on the metallicity and the age, so it's not perfectly ideal. And then, of course, the one that I've gotten to at the end is the tip of the red giant branch, and that's the one that I want to talk about. So the tip of the red giant branch uh, is the end of the red giant sequence. So these are just, this is a cartoon. It's completely a cartoon that Barry drew um, in PG plot, but I really like it because very simple. So we have color and magnitude on the side, and these are just some example stellar tracks where metallicity and age is changing in the different stellar tracks. And so the tip of the red giant branch is where the red giant branch sequence ends. And why does it end? So all along the red giant branch sequence, the core of the star is degenerate. Okay, it's, it's supported by degeneracy pressure. But the star is continuing to evolve. It has shell burning on the outside. It's continuing to evolve. When it reaches the end of its RGB phase of its life, the core actually reaches a mass or a temperature where it lifts the degeneracy in the core. And that uh, undergoes what's called the helium flash, which is a massive reorganization of its internal structure. And then it goes way over to the horizontal branch and different things happen. Uh, so this happens very suddenly in a star's lifetime, which is why you get a well-defined edge. And it happens for a fixed core mass or core temperature. And so that's a statistical physics thing that I found out that I did actually in my undergraduate statistical physics class. So literally everyone in this room could work out the physics of when and how this happens. And because there's a fixed temperature coming from the core, there's a fixed bolometric flux coming from the core for all of these stars, which is just modulated by the chemistry of its atmosphere and the band that we're observing. So when we observe in the blue where the majority of the metal lines are, more metal rich stars are extincted because of the lines, and metal poor stars tend to be brighter. In the red, the infrared H band, those same metal rich stars now have re emitted flux from those warm, warm metals that makes them brighter, and the metal poor stars are fainter. I band, for whatever miraculous reason, sits right at this transition point, and for the majority of stars, so more, less metal poor than about half the dex solar. The, the uh, metallicity seems to be fixed to within, say, 5%. Or sorry, the brightness seems to be fixed. And that's empirical observation based. Uh, no theoretical models can actually predict this, this accurately. And, and they will tell you that easily, hands down. We don't know how to do these physics well enough to do that. But this is an incredibly powerful tool because RGB stars, and more importantly, metal poor RGB stars, are in every type of galaxy out there. I actually can challenge you to find a galaxy that doesn't have metal poor RGB stars. The only ones would be tidal dwarfs, and there's actually not a lot of convincing evidence that those are even real because people haven't actually looked for their old component. So we can measure a distance, a statistically based distance based off the tip of the red giant branch to any type of galaxy, face on, edge on, nearby, distant, big, small, star forming, not star forming, whatever. And that's incredibly powerful for this problem. So the pros, it's not variable, we understand the physics, we can apply it to any galaxy we want, uh, we can apply it to the halos of those galaxies where the stellar density is low, we don't have to worry about stellar crowding. And because we're working with older 
low velocity stars, actually the stars that are fundamentally in our halo that we can observe locally, are no different from the stars in the supernova 1A host halos. Or they shouldn't be. There would have to be an incredible conspiracy of the universe that would be very different because they were forming at the same time. The other thing is the metallicity effect is projected into color. It's slightly annoying, but it's also very powerful because I don't have to go out and get spectra. I can do it all with imaging. Um, and I need a single data set to make this. I don't have to find them in optical and then remeasure them in infrared. Um, and then it's a red candle, which is going to be great for the future. The cons is that we don't have a century's legacy of working with these stars. The method was only really discovered in 1993. There's an incredible non-uniformity of application in the literature. It's an absolute uh, mess. And there's no direct trigonometric calibration. So what I've done for the past four years is address these problems. We have to measure every supernova host for the first time. We have to develop the techniques that we can apply locally and out into the Hubble flow. So over 20 magnitudes and distance, we need consistent photometry on the same systematic system. Uh, that is hard. And uh, we are going to have to go collect the ancillary data in the wave bands we use to make use of those Gaia parallaxes. Because it turns out that the brightest stars have the worst measured magnitudes, usually with 20 to 40 percent flux uncertainties because they're from photographic plates. And no one has actually bothered to go back and observe them. Great. One percent distance, 40 percent flux error. Um, and this is true in the optical and the infrared. Um, so we're going to build a sample. So we had a Hubble program approved um, to get distances to all of these galaxies and more using the tip of the red giant branch, which is why I made this slide. Standardized techniques, and this is the hard part. And so I'm going to demonstrate the standardized techniques using something that's nearby, IC 1613 Little Dwarf Galaxy, and something that's far away, this is NGC 1365, 2011 MR. No one knows? Okay. So the host, uh, it actually has several supernova. Uh, in this galaxy, um, and it's at 4 max distance, so 20, about 20 megaparsecs. So what you see here is the ACS field that we use relative to the galaxy. It's off in the spiral arm out in the halo. Um, and basically, I just show a zoom that this is effectively an empty field besides background galaxies. But when you zoom in, you get individual RGB stars that are well separated, easy to measure. IC1613 is a little bit more challenging because it's nearby and HST has a tiny field of view. So our ACS footprints are here. We need several of them to make the measurement and we ultimately tie it to ground-based observations to get the statistics. Um, so here are the color magnitude diagrams that we make for these two galaxies. So this is a ground-based CMD that's been calibrated to uh, Hubble. So we move it up to the Hubble system. This is the red giant branch here. There's a few young stellar populations We're using the outer parts of the galaxy. Uh, there's your truncation. You can read it off with your eye. Um, it's one of Barry's favorite things to do. Distant galaxy, lower signal to noise, a lot harder. Remember, this is a 20 megaparsec. Uh, but there's that same red giant branch, and you can see that it's truncating in there. You just can't read it off with your eye. But it's there. Uh, and this color bar is, is the same. It's meant to be the same thing, to show you the metal at the end. Um, what we do is we actually marginalize over the color axis and we make a luminosity function. And for this work, we did it only in this blue box because we can tell that there are younger stellar populations there that we don't want to contaminate. Here's our luminosity function. There's that jump that we expect at the tip. I can read it off with my eye. This has been at 0 .05, 0 0.005 magnitudes. So it's basically the precision limit of our photometry. We're bidding. I know a lot of people don't like bidding, but we're bidding at our precision limit, which is kind of like not bidding. <laughs> and then we run a edge detector, so an approximation to the first derivative. So this bin minus that bin. Uh, and look for that edge. There it is. Boom. Distance. Uh, it's 1% measurement of the distance to IC1613. We actually, the biggest uncertainty here is the actual extinction. Because we don't actually know what it is internal these stars. Far field, we do the exact same thing. Again, it's not as clean, which is why I show you both at the same time. But there's that luminosity function. You see it rising. Um, you, can't, you can tell that something's happening here, but you can't quite figure it out with eye. We run that same edge detector, uh, and we get a peak happening here, and we call that the tip of the red giant. 
Uh, also, it's a 2% random uncertainty measurement um, uh, to this galaxy at 20 megaparsecs. Equal precision, near and far, exact same techniques. Beautiful, very clean. The way we get uncertainties is something that we're still working on, but we basically do a data-driven approach where we put in thousands upon thousands of artificial stars and measure them through our entire photometry pipeline. We pull them out, we make artificial luminosity functions, and we measure the tip. So we make it on the input stars, and we measure it on the output stars. And we think this is going to take into account everything that's going on in this system that's very hard to model. Things like charge transfer inefficiencies, PSF mismatch, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so the basic idea is that we pick smoothing scales uh, that match, and we use this data-driven way to get our uncertainties. There's probably a better way to do this. This is just what we have. Uh, right now. We can talk, a lot of people like to talk more about this, but the general idea is that you subsample down your artificial stars, make a luminosity function, and then you, you get this blurring that looks phenomenologically a lot like what we see and expect. Uh, so we've done this for six supernova galaxies. There's a total of nine in our sample. Uh, seven of them have been published. Um, one of them, I have to submit the paper, hopefully before I leave. Uh, and two more are being worked on by a graduate student. Um, and these are the CMDs. So this is a nearby galaxy. This is, for comparison, this is kind of what you naively expect. And this is what we actually work with at 20 megaparsecs. It's, it's a mess. It's hard. <laughs> these are six, so the NGC 1365 is a 16 orbit proposal with HST to get photometry at this depth. We're detecting the tip at uh, 29 magnitude. Um, but then the other thing that we have to think about is if we want to do this globally and throughout uh, for more galaxies, for more supernova galaxies, maybe even for other astrophysical problems, uh, we really need to think about how we pick our fields and if we can do this reliably and say with certainty I can get you a distance to that galaxy to this precision. So to do that I've been using M101 which actually does have a lot of archival data in the HST database because of its star forming. It's like a UV uh, spectroscopy. They do a lot there. And so you have all these pointings out in its halo that I can use to measure the TRGB. And so these are five fields. This is our field, which is this one out here picked to be out in the halo. And these are the additional fields. And they're slightly shallower, much shallower, but they also tend to be more inner and they're sitting sort of on the edge of the spiral arms. And what I've been doing in these fields is trying to understand if we can get precision distances where we have other stellar populations or if we really do have to work out in the halos where it's a little bit harder and there's fewer stars. Um, and the answer is we have more stars as we go in, but we have more contamination. We have more crowding. We also have internal extinction because the majority of these stars are in the disk. So if you think about the structure of the galaxy, putting a probe through, most of these are in the disk. Or we're seeing populations of different extinctions. And I ultimately discovered that I cannot conclusively measure a distance to these fields. Uh, but I, I can here. So measuring, doing this out in the halo is really important for the precisions that we're quoting here. If you're OK with 10%, this is fine. If you're not OK with 10%, you have to push a little harder. And then we can actually go back to surface brightness profiles. So this is the WISE surface brightness profile, and this is a Galex, far and near UV. And I can actually correlate the populations that I see with these surface brightness profiles. And the thing is, we have these for almost every galaxy in the sky, because WISE is an all-sky mission, and most of the calibrators are going to be big enough that we have it. So we can actually go in and use these surface brightness profiles, ideally in two dimensions, obviously, to pick the fields a priori. So we're not going to end up in an NGC 4424 situation where it looked like we should find Cepheids there, but we didn't after we spent the 30 orbits with HST. That makes sense. We can do this a priori. Direct calibration is the hardest part um, because Gaia doesn't actually, well, it may, at the end of mission, it will give us um, spectrophotometry, but it doesn't give us magnitudes in the ground-based bands or the HST bands that we actually use. And these calibration uncertainties kill you in the end, as everyone in this Carnegie Supernova project knows. 
they just kill you because of the spectral energy uh, differences. So we actually are running um, tiny telescopes. So this is a 10 inch and that's a 12 inch and we're building a 17 inch that will operate in the near infrared uh, at Las Campanas that are actually observing every night autonomous uh, in an automated way observing bright stars to get us those magnitudes. Um, and uh, this is what you would get for the tip of the red giant branch using Hipparchus parallaxes. These are real error bars from the parallaxes. And this is what we have with Gaia DR1. And you can see this blob of stars is actually starting to look like an RGB. Um, we had a massive, uh, uh, the, the roll off, for whatever reason, opened in 70 mile per hour winds. So there hasn't been many updates to our stars uh, since I rebuilt the, I repaired the telescopes in the afternoons before observing on Magellan. Uh, so we should have an update on that soon. Uh, but in the meantime, we've observed local galaxies where we can use lots of different techniques uh, to get consensus distances and calibrate the tip of the red giant branch. And these are their CMDs on the same scale as the ones that I showed before. Um, and this is uh, harder because these things are crowded in HST. Um, and you have to work a little bit harder to get those out. So hopefully I've shown you that we're making a lot of progress on using the tip of the red giant branch as a tool to get us these supernova one and calibrated distances. Um, the final paper, our final H naught, is in my inbox. I'm on the red team. I haven't looked at the analysis. Um, I'm not allowed to tell you what the value is um, because I'm supposed to read it as an impartial observer. Um, but if we just do naive error budgets based on the things that we have published, we should get to about 2%, 2.5% of uh, what we have. Um, that's pretty impressive for a four year project, five year project. Um, so we're nearly done, and what did we learn? Uh, one thing that we learned is that even the most nearby galaxies, uh, getting distances is hard. These are all the distances since 2001 to IC 1613 via Cepheid's RLRS, the Red Giant Branch. And you can see um, how much they scatter based on the colors or wavelength, uh, open and filled circles, or when I homogenize to different terms. Uh, there's a lot we still have to do in the distance scale to pull everything together, but we do believe we have a distance to some of the nearby galaxies. And we do believe that these, these uh, uh, techniques all agree or, or reach a consensus on what these distances are. So if we do that, if we assume that we, we, we know that Cepheids and Aralyra and Tip of the Red Giant Branch all agree locally, then when we do the comparison between the Tip of the Red Giant Branch distances in the supernova hosts um, and the Cepheid distances in the supernova hosts, we're homogenizing over all the things that we can't know about those very distant Cepheids. We don't have individual metallicities. We know that there might be crowding issues, uh, all sorts of things built in. And what we find for the seven hosts that we publish is that the distances agree in the mean to within 1%. Cool, so maybe we didn't learn anything. I don't know, but when I said that at this big meeting in Berlin with everyone who studies the Hubble constant, Theorist came up to me and said, you convinced me that I have to work harder and there might be something here. So it's actually very useful to do this stuff even though it's long and I think we've developed a technique that will be very useful in the future too. Um, so we're probably gonna get a very similar H9 to, to put all that together. It depends a lot on the details, but it's gonna be pretty close. Um, and so how do we push this further and uh, pushing it further is getting more time on Hubble, which is hard, uh, or JW. Uh, and we need you know, 50 or 60 hosts to actually push down this calibration down to say the 1% level. And so we need volume. You need things that are brighter and you need bigger temperatures. <coughs> it's the age-old story of astronomy. But we do gain something with the tip of the red giant branch that we don't gain with Cepheus, and that is that they are red candles. So this is a complicated plot, but I'm gonna walk you through it. We have B, V, R, I, J, H, K, L, and M. What is this 3.5, 3.6, and 4.5? That's a typographical error. And then I've shown here the band where the Hubble has access, where W first will have access, and where the James Webb will have some access. Okay. And this is for a galaxy NGC 6822. It's a little dwarf in the little group um, that has exquisite data in the archive. So here's the I-band that we've been talking about and what, what Erica did as her um, intern project 
So I actually select the stars that are at the tip and they're plotted here, which is through a giant branch. And here are the Cepheids. And so we can immediately see how much brighter the Cepheids are than the tip of the red giant branch in the optical, which is why optically Cepheids go out to 35 megaparsecs, we only go out to about 20 megaparsecs in equivalent allocations. If we go to the blue, um, you see that tipping TRGB like we expect. Um, and you can also see just how much more powerfully bright these Cepheids were. So photographic plates, Hubble, were all working sort of in these kinds of bands, and this is why it was the tool, because this is, this is no contest, right? But our future is in the infrared. So here is the same plot going into JHK. So you're seeing that upslope that we talked about, and you're also seeing where these Warmer stars are now getting fainter relative to the cooler stars as we go into the red bands. In fact, in the K band, these stars are brighter than the fainter Cepheids that you use on the bottom. And I only have to observe them once. I don't have to get periods, I only have to get there once. And then in the, inf in the mid infrared, stellar physics goes kind of crazy, but they continue to get brighter. Um, it's unclear if we'll actually be able to use this, but it's going to be fun to try. So moving forward, we can actually get the volume that we need to get 50, 100 supernova calibrated uh, by using the infrared to the red giant branch. Um, I am, our group is not the only group to have thought about this. This is a program by Julian Delcan, the SNAP program, where they looked at nearby galaxies and got these IR CMDs. There's the tip of the red giant branch right there. It, it's tipped, but if you can calibrate the tip, you can flatten it out, apply a correction, there's your edge, uh, use the same tools that we used before. Meredith Durbin, a graduate student at um, Washington, is working with the sort of uh, pan chromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury toolkit and all the galaxies that they've observed, turning it into a laboratory for understanding how this method works in different environments, different types of galaxies. It's going to be really exciting when she finishes that up. And to demonstrate that this is an incredibly powerful tool, we're going to step back to the LMC. This is the two-mass plot of the LMC. There's something like hundreds of thousands of stars in two-mass. Um, here's its color magnitude diagram. There's a red giant branch. There's your tip. And um, here's where we just select stars um, at the tip and plot them on the sky. Those are you know, tens of degrees on the sky, um, out in its halo, um, many, many stars. So what we did was we actually did a tessellation effect where we have area that have equal numbers to get different distances. And these are color coded uh, by the distance that we measure where blue is near and red is far. The black lines is a really wonderful survey that Lucas Macri did and we used their data as well but and tied them all together um, which focus on the bar. And then these points are actually eclipsing binary. And so each of these cells gives us a different distance uh, to different parts of the LMC, and we actually can see its internal structure. So there's the bar, which is tilted, and then on one side you have high extinction from 30 Doradas. Then there's the disk, which is more or less the same, but also slightly tilted back. And then you get some sort of extended disk, which is also tilted, and this agrees phenomenologically with everything that we know about the LMC, and we pulled it out uh, from archival data on two mass that's been sitting there for the past 20 years. Um, so it works incredibly well, um, and it's very exciting. So I want to leave uh, with this quote from Alan Sandage uh, that was in his obituary um, written by Dennis Overby, um, and I think it was also in Lonely Hearts of the Cosmos. And he wrote, it's got to be fun. I don't think that anyone should tell you that he slogged his way through 25 years on a problem and there's only one reward at the end, and that's the Hubble constant. That's a bunch of hooey. The reward is learning all the wonderful properties of the things that didn't work along the way. And so the translation is that my view on this problem and moving forward with this problem is that maybe the TRGB isn't the technique that we use at the end of the day. Maybe we go back to Cepheids. That would be great. That would be fun. Uh, maybe we use Myra's. Um, but history teaches us that the mindset that being open to new techniques be open to what we didn't know, we didn't know, um, is how we move forward in problems in cosmology and astronomy. So maybe we come up with something new, maybe a supernova goes off in the LMC, <laughs> we get the perfect calibration, uh, but uh, we, there's lots of other things we can do with the techniques that we discover here. Thank
one, one technique that seems to have dropped out of favor, I'm not quite sure why, is the service part of No, it's coming back. It's coming back. So uh, a wonderful student that I work with at Princeton, Scott Carlson, has now calibrated surface brightness fluctuations, the dwarf galaxies, way into the blue. The limitation has been that it only works, it's only been calibrated for metal rich populations in big dwarf, uh, sorry, big elliptical. And that means that it's not applicable to most situations in the universe. So we've actually been working using archival data from CFHT. Um, projected that calibration down, and there's hope that we can start applying this maybe to H0. Uh, right now we're working on uh, luminosity functions in nearby galaxies, the dwarf galaxies, but since it's calibrated down into blue populations, metal blue populations, we could try it on supernova host galaxies. Um, you have to find the right combination of seeing, depth, and pixel scale for it to work properly. It's a very finicky technique. But I think it's actually really cool because it's very cheap. You just need a fairly simple observation once. Two colors is useful. You don't have to resolve the stars, and you get the distance. If I can have a follow-up question. Yeah. I've had this discussion with Barry. I've never quite understood why you can go for I. It's true that it's flat, but if it's still there's just a mathematical transformation that's making it even flat. I think so why not go to R, where the sky is significantly uh, fainter, and you go deeper in the galaxies in R? Are you worried about the metallicity effects then? Yeah. Yeah, so you've convinced him because <laughs> the project we were doing where we were putting together these multi chromatic data sets are so that we can get the tilt um, as a function of color and band, specifically to go in and see if there's a better optimized way to do this. Um, for the three year tour that we took off on for this HST project, my postdoc, um, I was what we had. I is very efficient on HST, B is very efficient on HST. Uh, I don't think we've found the optimal way to use this technique yet. We found something that works, that gives us the precision, so that we can keep playing with it. I'm actually really excited. I work with the Hyper Supreme Cam Survey at Princeton to play with those bands. They're very similar to Sloan bands, but the, the data go down to say 27 magnitude. It's exquisite. Um, so, and there's some nearby galaxies, so I'm hoping my intern this summer will we'll just look at slopes and corrections and, and see if we can do things in these other bands, because then we can use DES. LSST, et cetera, et cetera, to do the same kind of science. I forget yeah. you said something about this already. If you look at it in a different band, B, I, H, do they all agree with those together? For the same galaxy? For the near, okay. so we were mostly doing this in very nearby right. things. It's a melody effect, it's not, a, it's not extinction. Or there are extinction concerns. Right. <laughs> um, so I tricked, so I used 6822, which is a trick because it's highly extincted. So some of what you're seeing there is extinction, and some of what you're seeing is physics. But it's actually indicative of the problem, actually. Most people don't right, 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 right. But um, so the challenge is, yeah. I said we do have consensus on distances in the yeah. local group, kind of. But we also kind of don't. So I would say the only galaxy we know the distance to well is the LMC. And a paper came out in Nature. We have a 1% measurement to the LMC. So that's why we did this play, we were playing with the LMC. There isn't wide field optical always for the LMC to do all these games, but you, you could play with it. Um, so yeah, um, you, you can do it in a relative sense by just putting together the multi-wavelength yeah. data sets. Um, if they don't agree, that would also tell you something. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, so I do see that in IC1613 where the Consensus distance, if you use half a hundred studies in the literature, is very much agrees with the mid infrared. And so the subtleties of what you assume for the extinction, even on the Cepheids, which actually have, a, sorry, the Cepheids sometimes have extinction around them because they're in star forming regions, um, or they're recently star forming areas, you can actually see a, a drift of the distances towards fainter things, even in IC1613. Uh, I see the same thing in M101, uh, those fields that I was talking about. Uh, when you go even to the more inner fields, the distances tend to be further back because there's more extinction. And so that's why we moved out into the halos where the extinction we think is lower, but it's always an unknown unknown that we have to contend with. But in the halos, it's less of an unknown true because the the quasar sight lines people, sorry, cold medicine is starting to fade, um, actually do detailed studies of what the extinction internal to halos they think is. Um, using 
various ways. And so we do have estimates, statistical estimates of what the effect might be. But, but you're right, moving into the infrared, I think will help, and also putting together these multi-wavelength data sets that in turn can play with us as well. Well, that's a uh, thank you very much.